Welcome to tonight's uh, Healthcare for All program. I'm Dr. Peter Lucas, board member of Healthcare for All Washington and a practicing psychiatrist in the Puget Sound area. And we're gonna mute everyone in order to focus on tonight's speakers. It's a great lineup, uh, but please add your questions and comments to the chat down at the bottom. And uh, please note that you can click on the closed caption icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen to enable captions to appear on your computer. And as the program goes along, please consider making a donation to support our work. Every donation helps us move toward universal health care. And we have set a goal to raise $500 tonight during this program. And you can find the link to our website in the chat. It'll be posted several times and you can make a donation anytime during this presentation. And as we usually do, we'll start with a land acknowledgement that we are participating in the Zoom meeting today from the lands of the Coast Salish peoples. Please take a moment to acknowledge peoples in the lands where you are joining us today. We acknowledge that all of the ancestral homelands and traditional territories of indigenous peoples who have been here since time immemorial. Our efforts to achieve health care for all shall include universal health care coverage for the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, the Alep, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Tonight, Sam Hatzenbeller, Health Policy Associate uh, with the Economic Opportunity Institute, will present her research on evidence-based solutions to improve regulation and transparency of the healthcare industry. She will start her presentation shortly and we'll follow that with the Q&A session. But first I'd like to introduce Washington State Senator Emily Randall from the 26th Legislative District and a member of the Senate Health and Long-Term Health Care Committee. She was one of the champions in creating the pathway to universal health care in our state through legislative action in 2019 by creating the Universal Healthcare War Group, which led to the current Universal Healthcare Commission, which is still in process of meeting. She has been a strong voice in a variety of other legislative actions to improve our healthcare system. Senator Randall, will you please describe your role as a member of the Universal Healthcare Commission and share your hopes for a healthy outcome from this work? Sure, thanks so much, Peter, for the introduction and to all of you for coming together tonight. I see so many familiar faces, folks who have been advocates for uh, universal health care, for a more affordable, more accessible system long before I joined the legislature. But for the past four years, I've, I feel so lucky to have been able to work alongside you to make our system a little more accessible and to continue envisioning the system that we deserve. Um, <clears throat> As you heard, I'm Senator Emily Randall. I represent the 26th district on the Kitsap Peninsula. That's uh, Bremerton, Port Orchard, Gig Harbor, and the Key Peninsula. And I, I have been in office for the last four years. And uh, I was driven to run, not because I always imagined that I would be in government, but because I have a personal family story with healthcare affordability and accessibility. Um, you know, many of you have heard me say this before, but you know, when I was seven years old, my sister Olivia was born with complex disabilities, and that happened to also be the year, because of some of the folks on this call, that Washington State expanded Medicaid. And that made the difference for my sister and my family. It allowed Olivia to live, you know, a full life at home with us, to be able to afford her uh, expensive specialists, the equipment she needed, her multiple surgeries. And you know, that was my first glimpse at how good government could make a difference in real people's lives. And I spent, you know, 10 years after college working in uh, as a fundraiser for healthcare organizations, uh, Children's Hospital, Planned Parenthood, San Francisco AIDS Foundation, trying to make the system work a little bit better for folks through, you know, raising private philanthropy. And I got to a point where I realized I can't raise enough private dollars to fix a system that is only getting more expensive. We need real systemic change from the policy level at the federal level and at the state level. And that's why I got 
involved in state politics. That's why I ran in the first place, because I know that Washington has been a leader before, that we continue to lead, and we have the potential to make real powerful change in people's lives by envisioning a system that takes the profit motive out of our healthcare system and that really is about meeting people's needs. Um, you know, so I, my first year in Olympia, as I, I served as vice chair of the Health and Long-Term Care Committee and introduced um, the Universal Healthcare Work Group, which then led to the um, creation of the Universal Healthcare Commission a couple of years later. And the commission has has begun meeting. We've only had a couple meetings so far, but we have some good information and good plans. And I mean, I, I do hear from neighbors who say, why do we need to keep studying it? We know what a better system is. But, um, you know, the, the process of deliberation and government is part of our democracy. And, and so, um, you know, we, we work to bring people along to convince more of our colleagues in the legislature about, um, you know, the, the right policies forward. And what excites me most about the Universal Healthcare Commission is that it empowers our agency leads who, you know, know so much better than legislators, how we can make the system work better for folks to apply for Medicaid waivers and to start building a more inclusive system without coming back to the legislature and having to pass another bill. You know, it took us two years and passing it two times to finally expand postpartum Medicaid to ensure that new birth parents have not just six, um, you know, two months of healthcare coverage, but they have a full year. We shouldn't have to come back and try and pass a bill two legislative sessions in a row to make this common sense decision. Our, our agency leads should be empowered to make those smart common sense decisions to use federal dollars in an innovative way to serve more people. And that's really exciting to me to, you know, get legislators like me out of the way so that, you know, the folks who are really leading on policy and informed by and working alongside leaders like all of you can do better for Washingtonians. This time of year, uh, it, I am spending a lot of time talking to a lot of neighbors um, in my community. Uh, walk down uh, local streets almost every day. And today I heard two really tough healthcare stories, stories that motivate me to continue this work. One was a, a woman I know was a local business owner um, who recently had a miscarriage and she was very excited about her pregnancy. And like, you know, so many people are, and like so many people, she lost it very early on. And She's been so transparent. And one of the things that she recently shared is that the bill she got from the hospital um, to determine that she had a miscarriage, this wasn't a you know complex procedure, it was you know some blood work and scans, um, was almost six thousand dollars. And she's lucky to have good insurance, but that is an expensive bill for a result, you know, that she already knew was happening. I talked to another neighbor who is, um, has terminal cancer and has, you know, they, they had good insurance, but the procedures after procedure after procedure, the costs have um, <clears throat> ended up so much that they're having really, making really tough decisions about what the end of his life will look like because they have lost so much into the healthcare system. Um, it's, you know, we all have human bodies that need care, but we shouldn't have to bankrupt ourselves and we shouldn't have to make such difficult decisions in order to get the care that we need. Um, you know, I, I have real faith in the work of our commission to better envision a system that works for all of us, but I also know there's more work to do. Um, some of you have worked on 
uh, a hospital mergers and acquisitions policy that we've introduced a couple years in a row and will continue to work towards because the mergers and acquisitions that we see in our health system um, despite what uh, administrators tell us about lowering costs and creating more efficiencies are only driving up costs for neighbors who have fewer and fewer options. You know, on the Kitsap Peninsula, we have one hospital system that folks can choose from unless you um, qualify to visit the Naval Hospital. And, and, and it is, you know, a, not a secular system. It's a system that, um, is driven by feels driven by a bottom line from uh, administrators and uh, outside of of our community and our state, who have this giant healthcare system that feels less and less about everyday people. We've done some work around um, health system transparency and around um, you know zooming in on the cost of primary care and ensuring we're spending more for the the services that folks need, the preventative services that keep them from getting those big expensive hospital bills. There is a lot to do and it sometimes it can feel really daunting, but I feel so lucky every day that I get to do this work alongside you and alongside our fellow colleague, my fellow colleagues who are champions for healthcare and that we're doing it in a state where we really have the chance to innovate where we're not fighting against um, huge factions, you know, pushing us to deny care to certain communities, pushing us to, um, you know, eliminate the language that we can use to deny gender affirming treatment to um, Washingtonians. We're, we're operating in a space of, with a, without some of those other barriers, but it is our responsibility given, you know, the the climate we are in to really lead, to make sure other states can see the work that is possible when we have this, you know, we have pro healthcare majorities and um, the opportunity to innovate. So, um, you know, Sam is the one with, with all the good policy ideas and I wanna make sure that she has enough time to tell you all about, you know, where we can go from here. But I just wanna thank all of you for committing so much of yourselves to this work and, Look forward to continuing to fight. Thank you, thank you. That was very good, uh, Senator. And um, I like the uh, the up close and personal stories you told about your neighbors and, and people in your family. That really really uh, makes it more poignant and compelling. Um, I'm now going to uh, introduce uh, Aaron Katz, who's uh, Principal Lecturer Emeritus with the School of Public Health at the University of Washington, and he will moderate the evening's discussion. Aaron has been the catalyst for healthcare reform in our state for over 25 years. And thank you all for, for all you've done to improve the health of all Washingtonians. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you, Peter. Um, you make me feel young with the 20, 25 years. I wish it was only 25 years. Um, uh, it's great to see um, all uh, my comrades on this uh, on this uh, Zoom session, and uh, I'm really excited to be able to introduce uh, Sam Hatzenbeeler. So Sam um, uh, got her Master of Public Health degree from University of Washington from the Community Oriented Public Health Practice Program in the School of Public Health. She started work with, um, with the Economic Opportunity Institute in 2014 when she was a graduate policy intern focusing on women's economic security. And she now manages the EOI's health policy portfolio. Sam also co-chairs the Healthcare as a Human Right Policy Committee and serves on the Health Equity Technical Advisory Committee, as well as the Cascade Care Work Group for the Washington Health Benefit Exchange. And Sam has a faculty appointment with the, uh, uh, as a clinical instructor in the School of Public Health. Uh, that's a bio that, that Sam sent to me, but she left off the, actually the most important thing about Sam, and that is she's a former student of mine, and I'm very proud of her. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Sam so that she can present her 
her findings from the from the report. Well, thank you very much, Erin. And yeah, it's it's really special to to be here with you. I've known you ten years now, um, and as my my grad school policy instructor. So thanks for that warm introduction. And I just wanted to thank Ronnie and Healthcare for All for inviting me to speak on my research tonight. I really admire the work that you all do, and many of you have been in this fight for for many years. So I stand on your shoulders and. Just want to thank you for all the work that you've done. Um, and um, yeah, also just um, an honor to be on the call with Senator Randall, who's an amazing advocate for health equity. So also, I think my mom is here. So hello. Hello, mom. Um, all right. So I just want to uh, share my screen here so you can see some slides. And can I get a thumbs up so that you can see my slides. All right, great. All right, um, so let's get started. So um, I am a policy associate at the Economic Opportunity Institute and our mission is to build a, an economy that works for all. We, progressive Policy Think Tank have been around almost 25 years and I manage our health policy portfolio, but we also work on paid leave. And you can see in the, the lower picture there that is Governor Inslee signing paid family medical leave into law. Um, our policy director just retired, Marilyn Watkins is there. Um, also equal pay, childcare, higher ed and progressive tax reform. That top right photo is, you know, it's surprisingly challenging or maybe unsurprisingly challenging to get a staff photo in the pandemic. So that's our most recent one. It's a bit outdated, but um, just gives you a sense of some of our staff and board. I am very happy and honored to get to discuss my report. Um, I published this in January on controlling healthcare costs. And I really wanted to do this because I just wanted to wrap my mind around why do we spend so much on healthcare in our country and what can we do about it on the state level? And so what I thought might be a few pages ended up being almost 35 pages. Turns out it's a complex topic, um, but I did my best to make the report accessible um, even if you're not a healthcare economist, which I certainly am not. Um, but I do believe that it's really, really important for advocates to wrap our minds around this. And, um, and controlling healthcare spending is a key aspect to improving our current system and to helping to pave the way for universal coverage. The other reason I'm really fired up about this is because I watched a bunch of awesome bills, including Senator Randall's Keep Our Care Act, and a bill from Representative Cody on regulating um, contracting between hospitals and insurance companies and Representative Macri's facility fees bill and many others um, get tanked by uh, healthcare industry opposition this past session. And those are a bunch of great bills that I think would have made a big difference. And I think that we have our work cut out for us to really unite and build strong coalitions to advocate for patient needs. Um, <laughs> And all right, so um, and I've started having conversations after after this last session to regroup with many advocates, including healthcare as a human right campaign, um, Northwest Health Law advocates, many more starting to strategize about, strategize about next session. So I split my presentation tonight up into three parts. One, defining the problem, two, naming the causes of the problem, and three, spotlighting some solutions. So let's get into it. So what's the problem? Why does it matter? I'm getting a little bit of background noise. I'm not sure if others are getting that. Um, seems like everyone's muted though. All right, I'll keep going. Um, before we jump in though, I wanna define some terms because I'll admit these cost, price, rates, they all get used interchangeably but they don't all mean the same thing. So just, just to go over this a little bit to make sure we're on the same page. So cost, cost just depends on who you're talking about. So provider's cost, that's the expense incurred to deliver healthcare services to patients. We talk about payer costs, that's the amount payers like insurance companies uh, or Medicaid, Medicare pay to providers for services that they provided. Um, and patient costs, the amount that we pay as patients out of pocket for healthcare services. Charge or price, that's the amount that shows up on our medical bill for a service like an MRI or an X-ray. Um, and then reimbursement rates. 
That's the payment made to by a third party to a provider for services. And there's a variety of ways that can take place. Fee for service, where you a provider receive an amount for every single service delivered per diem, like each day in the hospital or for each episode of hospitalization or capitation where a provider receives an amount for each patient under their care. So now that we have those terms, um, just the background, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but it has to be said, US healthcare costs are out of control. US healthcare system is the most expensive in the world and our system consumes nearly one in five dollars in the US economy every year. Medical debt is an enormous issue facing families. It affects at least 20% of Americans. And over the past 10 years or so, unpaid medical bills actually became the largest source of debt that Americans owe. This is outrageous and needs to be addressed. Um, this of course is falling disproportionately on black and Latinx households. But as we know, higher spending does not lead to higher quality, better health outcomes, improved equity, but it does put families, employers, governments under enormous strain, and it makes healthcare harder to access. It also forces us to spread our money further, which puts thing, our other priorities at risk, like education and transit and mitigating climate change. Um, these are precious funds. So, um, so higher spending means higher costs for patients. Our pocketbooks feel the squeeze. And premiums, which of course is just the monthly cost we pay to buy coverage, doesn't speak to all the other costs like deductibles and coinsurance. But premiums have risen faster than wages and inflation. You can see here that premiums alone have risen by 47% over the last decade, while worker earnings have only risen by 31%. So who cares about high healthcare prices? Is it nerds like me? No, turns out it's everybody. Um, new bipartisan polling shows that uh, two thirds of voters say that reducing healthcare costs is their top priority for the president and Congress to address. And um, this is a sad fact that, that really motivates a lot of the work that I do. Um, one out of every six US workers has reported staying in a job they didn't want for fear of losing their health insurance. I think that points to the problem of having a health care system that is based on uh, largely on employer-sponsored coverage. And it's not just patients that are concerned, um, even employers feel the crunch. And um, with a recent Kaiser Family Foundation report in or survey in last year, it, um, eight out of 10 corporate executives uh, reported believing that greater government involvement is needed to regulate healthcare costs. So I th think that is a really striking uh, number there. So what's driving the trend? Uh, what are we spending our money on? This is a graph from a recently released healthcare cost trend report from the Office of the Insurance Commissioner and in our state. And so it, um, it shows that here on the commercial market in the last few years, the fastest growing prices have, um, and, and I'll explain it in case those numbers are too small to read, um, inpatient hospital services, that's the red line, um, that's grown up, grown by 16% over of this last three year period uh, from 2016 to 2019 and pharmaceuticals in green, that's grown by 15%. So compare these to inflation, um, which is the gray dotted line, that's only grown by 7%. Um, of course, the inflation rate um, is gonna be different this year given skyrocketing inflation, but that's for a different presentation. Um, just wanted to show that it's been in recent years. Um, okay, so what are the causes of high healthcare spending? Is it as healthcare industry lobbyists claim due to high paying our workers good wages, high patient utilization rates, tight regulation? Uh, no, it's not, time again. Decade after decade, the research shows that these are not the largest drivers of high healthcare costs. So what is it? So in my report, for my research, I argue that there is one main cause of skyrocketing healthcare spending. If we really had to boil it down to one thing, I believe that that is a lack of sufficient governmental regulation. And the let the market decide 
laissez-faire approach has not worked. It doesn't work for patients. It doesn't work for employers. Um, and it's, it's led to the system where profits and not patients are the top priority, like Senator Randall said. It's led to rapidly increasing consolidation, a lack of transparency, and enormous profits for industry giants. So let's talk about consolidation. This Pac-Man is my little joke about mergers and acquisitions. Um, so what is consolidation? It is, first of all, it's a key driver of healthcare spending. Um, consolidation takes place when a company acquires, merges, or affiliates with another, and there's a couple of types. There's horizontal consolidation, and that is when one company buys out its competitor. So an example would be um, when Common Spirit merged with Washington uh, Virginia Mason last year. Um, incidentally, Common Spirit already owns 142 hospitals across the country, so it's a mega conglomerate. Consolidations can also occur vertically when a company acquires companies up and down the supply chain. So um, an example of this is Optum, which is the pharmacy benefit manager, when they purchase two um, major clinic systems locally in Washington, the Everett Clinic and the Poly Clinic. Um, Optum is also a subsidiary of United Health Group, which also owns major insurance conglomerate United Healthcare. So it's a PBM clinic insurance that's all up and down the supply chain. So basically, as fewer and fewer companies own a greater share of the market, they're able to exert more leverage on the system and they can set prices for services um, and pharmaceuticals to maximize their re revenue rather than basing them on the actual cost of providing care and without regard for the impact on access, equity, and affordability. So what are the impacts of consolidation? Consolidation by and large leads to higher costs for patients. A 2016 Federal Trade Commission report found that hospital monopolies were able to charge 15% more than those that had more competitors. And for acquisitions in really concentrated markets, um, it's even higher. We've seen price increases of more than 20% in hospital systems and even up to 30% in physician clinics. Consolidation also leads to worse health outcomes because it leads to fewer provider and drug options. Um, here's a fun fact, not so fun, that so many physician practices have been acquired by hospitals that nearly half of all primary care physicians are now actually employed by hospitals. And hospitals like acquiring clinics because they can get more money by charging facility fees for doctor visits, um, which used to only be um, used for hospital visits. Consolidation also leads to price variation, tremendous price variation. Recent exposés have revealed that the wide variation in what hospitals can charge for their services. So to use a Washington example, a knee replacement can cost about $6,000 in a medical center, or up to 13 times that amount for the same exact service at a Washington multi-care hospital. And we're seeing this variation even for patients receiving the same services at the same hospital. Also from an economic standpoint, consolidation puts downward pressure on healthcare worker wages because workers have fewer choices in a monopolized system. All right, I just wanna talk briefly about why consolidations are continuing unchecked and how this contributes to a lack of transparency. Um, so at the federal level, the Federal Trade Commission and the U.S. Department of Justice are the two federal agencies that are responsible for tracking and enforcing um, federal and state antitrust laws and maintaining competitive markets. But the FTC lacks um, sufficient capacity, resources, and regulatory authority to actually effectively review and address um, mergers and acquisitions. And once they're in place, they're very difficult to reverse. So almost half of merger challenges in the past 20 years have been in the healthcare industry, but our federal oversight agencies cannot keep up. Um, just an example, the Federal Trade Commission's budget has remained pretty constant um, over the last 
10 years, but even though hospital mergers have increased by 50%. The FTC is also prohibited um, from enforcing antitrust laws for nonprofits, which is a major problem because nonprofits accounted for 66% of hospital and health system mergers in 2019. Um, I think it's important to make a note about nonprofits here because nonprofits are exempt, of course, from paying federal and state income tax, sales tax, property tax, um, and they have no limits on the size of reserves that they can amass. So in return, they're required to you know, report the community benefits that they provide, but many nonprofits have been found to stockpile billions of dollars in reserve and pay their top executives millions of dollars. Um, in 2021, um, yeah, so that's, that's my, my note on nonprofits. I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more when I talk about um, Washington and what we're doing on that. Um, and in terms of federal regulation, um, the threshold for reviewing transactions was uh, 92 million in 2021. This amount might seem high to you or I, but it actually leaves many transactions, um, particularly those that are, um, are vertical consolidations out of the federal review process. So even though they can result in severely, um, even though they can result in, in severely reduced market competition, I should say it's too high. We need it to be lower so that we can actually um, adequately review um, all of the transactions that we need to. Um, the federal government, actually under the Trump administration, um, attempted to improve transparency for hospitals when they put the hospital price transparency rule into effect, um, and that, that came into effect last year. And it requires hospitals to post the prices um, they negotiate with insurance carriers for about 70 shoppable services like and imaging and lab services. Um, and even though the ruling has survived um, multiple uh, attempts in court, to remove it, it still remains in, in place, but it's ineffective because of low hospital compliance and um, insufficient penalties to uh, motivate compliance. So who is profiting? Who's making money off of this? Um, here's a few um, New York Times headlines from the past couple of years. Uh, I know many people have, have read these articles, but large hospital systems continue to see record-breaking profits year over year. In 2016, U.S. hospitals brought in their highest profits ever in recorded history, and these profits continue to rise even during the pandemic. One example, um, many of you may have heard this already, but Providence Health System, which operates Swedish um, here in our state, received more than $500 million in federal pandemic assistance in 2020, adding to its already existing reserves of $12 billion. And they also collect about a billion dollars per year from their hedge fund investments, um, all while paying zero dollars in federal taxes because um, it's a nonprofit. So we also see huge disparities in compensation. Corporate executives in the healthcare industry are paid some of the highest salaries of all US companies of any sector. Um, for the highest 100 paid, um, the 100 highest paid health industry CEOs in 2020, the median compensation was about $15.5 million. But during that same period, thousands of essential healthcare workers were going on strike because across the country because they were um, facing understaffing, low wages, unsafe working conditions, and ironically, a lack of affordable healthcare benefits. Well, I should ask her password. They don't give me a password. Getting some feedback. Peter, can, sure can Ron, can you mute everybody? Yes. Hopefully they get some tech support. Um, Sam, you're on mute. Got muted. Okay, let's try that again. Um, Let's talk about solutions. So long-term expanding affordable, sustainable universal coverage is the best solution to fix our overly complex and profit-driven healthcare system. 
Um, but we can take steps in the near term to control costs and set us on the pathway to these long-term universal solutions. And I believe that state level policy is a great place to start because while federal policy change is necessary to create a universal system, states in the meantime can act with more expediency and flexibility to limit corporate power and regulate imbalanced markets. So the rec recommendations in my report, there's actually about 15 or 16 of them. Um, they're broken down into four sections targeted price regulation, that's my personal favorite, uh, transparency and cost growth benchmarks, antitrust enforcement and consumer protection, and improving drug affordability. But I'm not gonna go into to all 15 or 16, don't worry. Um, feel free to read my report if you'd like to delve in deeper. Um, but today I just wanna give a few examples of how some other states are tackling this issue. So targeted price regulation. Um, as I said, one reason it's really important to address this is that without regulation, hospitals and pharmaceutical companies in particular have an outsized power to determine rates. Here's a fun fact. Um, hospitals are not so fun. Um, hospitals negotiate reimbursement rates with commercial insurers on average at about 247% of Medicare rates, and it can be up as high as 300% of Medicare rates. And this is actually far beyond what services actually cost to provide. So this is one reason why it's really important that the government um, take, play a role in regulating what um, can be determined for rates. I wanted to highlight a good step that Washington State took recently in 20 the first public option called Cascade Care Select, and that includes an aggregate reimbursement rate, rate cap of 160% of Medicare rates. Um, this is a good step in the right direction, but its effectiveness so far has been hindered due to a lack of ability to enforce hospital participation. Um, but thankfully that's in the process of being addressed um, due to some new legislation. So what other states are doing? I wanted to highlight Maryland's Health Services Cost Review Commission. Um, this was created in the 70s to set uniform and mandatory hospital payment rates for all payers, um, including Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial payers. Washington actually used to have an all payer rate setting system of some kind, a commission, um, but industry pressure to allow providers to control prices um, caused us to fall out of favor. So side note, if you are someone who was around during this, when this was in place, or you happen to know a lot about it, I would love to talk to you and learn more about it. Um, so back to Maryland, um, they, their model has definitely had some success. They are, um, I believe one of two or three states that still have this um, type of a system in place. It's resulted in decreasing the growth in hospital costs per capita, it's reduced variation in hospital prices, and it's helped finance hospitals uncompensated care, which is probably why it's continued to be uh, strongly supported by the state's hospital industry. In 2014, the state partnered with um, CMMI, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, to improve the program and convert from a fee-for-service system to a global hospital budget system um, aligned with their cost growth benchmarks. So in case this is a new term for anyone, the uh, global hospital budget and um, that can provide hospitals with fixed and predictable revenues every year. Um, so their goal in instituting this global budget model was to save $330 million in hospital expenditures for Medicare beneficiaries over a five-year period. So did they meet their goal? Yes, they did, and much more. They actually saw savings of $800 million just for Medicare beneficiaries um, over that five-year period. And they also had a 6% expenditure decrease in hospital spending for patients with commercial plans. The second recommendation section is around expanding transparency and using cost growth benchmarks. Um, a lack of sufficient regulation, again, has led to profit-centered business models, and that's made it really difficult for consumers and policymakers alike to understand the true cost of care. Um, and 
I just want to make a note. This is also part of many conversations with, with Aaron Katz, that improving price transparency can assist regulators and advocates and policymakers to understand the system, understand the cost so that we can limit industry influence. But um, I want to caution us as an advocate community that um, consumer facing transparency efforts alone um, really are, I believe, misguided because it really places the burden on patients to find the best rate, um, often at a time when patients are seeking acute care, which is not the best time to shop around for the best provider. Um, also, systems that we're seeing hospital use for transparency are very hard to access and hard to understand. So Washington has made some good progress um, on this front in recent years, and probably thanks to many of you on this call. Um, the first one is by creating an all-payer claims database in 2014. Many states already have this. I think, I think it's like 23 states have this. And the APCD basically collects claims and um, payment data for healthcare system. Um, unfortunately, it's limited because of a court case in 2016 that, and that um, prohibits states, APCDs, from requiring self-insured and private employer group health plans from submitting their data. And unfortunately, that represents about 30% of coverage. Um, so that will need to be improved somehow. Um, Washington also has taken a step by creating the Healthcare Cost Transparency Board in 2020. They're doing some great work right now. Um, they have the authority to identify cost trends and set cost growth, cost growth benchmark, which they're working on right now, and to develop recommendations for reducing healthcare spending. However, the potential success of the board, I believe, will be hindered until we can address the lack of enforcement authority that the board has, the lack of teeth. Um, states can improve the effectiveness of cost growth benchmarks by adding enforcement mechanisms. That's something that Oregon has done. They did that last year by adding accountability mechanisms um, to, their, to their board, which had been created in um, 2019. And it basically enables the Oregon Health Authority to institute performance improvement plans for payers and providers, um, assess financial penalties if they are exceeding the benchmark um, or if they are refusing to participate. So that's one example. Antitrust regulation and consumer protection, that's number three. Um, some great steps forward here. One more historical, the Consumer Protection Act from 1961 that um, creates or created guardrails around unfair and anti-competitive business practices like monopolizing trade um, or decreasing market competition. A great update to this law came in 2019, the Notice of Material Change Law. And this is actually really strong compared to a lot of um, states. It requires entities to um, provide the Attorney General's Office with 60 days prior notice of all mergers, acquisitions, or affiliations of hospitals, hospital systems, and provider orgs with no minimum dollar threshold. Um, so we're one of only five states that requires um, notice of transactions for more than just hospitals. And it also actually includes both for and nonprofit hospitals and providers. So like I said from before, Federal Trade Commission cannot um, enforce on nonprofit hospitals, but Washington state has taken a more aggressive approach. Um, unfortunately, weakness of this law currently is that with a $200 a day penalty, um, that's still too low to motivate compliance. So let's take a uh, look at Massachusetts um, because any highlight on healthcare reform should always include Massachusetts. Um, they have a tri-agency approach to cost containment, which actually also includes their cost growth benchmark, but what I wanna focus on for this piece is their antitrust um, review element of their system. But just for a background, um, in 2012, Massachusetts established its Health Policy Commission. It's an independent government agency and that works on reducing costs and um, aiming to make healthcare more affordable. They can analyze data, make recommendations and set a cost growth benchmark like the one that we are working on here in our state. 
They also have a sister agency called the Center for Health Information and Analysis that provides data on long-term costs and spending trends. That's something that the federal government has not been able to put in place at the federal level. So that is really something remarkable that Massachusetts is doing. It also um, has given its Office of Attorney General the authority to investigate the drivers of healthcare costs. Um, so they really have, you know, like this triple arm of getting a lot of data analysis to support their review of mergers and acquisitions um, between healthcare entities. And the AG's office in Massachusetts also has the authority to um, block a transaction in court if it would, if it's found or suggested to um, limit market competition. And so they can really use all of this data from Chia and from HPC to really guide their, um, guide their authority, guide their action. So that's, that's really remarkable. So like I said, they, um, they have a lot of data, they have long-term monitoring of consolidation trends, that's something the feds don't have. And another thing that they've put into place, which the feds have not, is um, to improve post-transaction oversight. And I love this. Um, they require the healthcare entities to actually pay for the monitoring. Um, this is really important because um, state agencies really need the authority to review what happens after a consolidation is approved um, for any negative impacts in, in case they need to be mitigated. All right, and last but not least, improving drug affordability. Um, Again, we've taken some great steps here in our state. In 2019, the Washington legislature created the Prescription Drug Price Transparency Program, and that requires health insurance companies, PBMs, which stands for pharmacy benefit managers, and drug manufacturers to submit data to the healthcare authority to create an annual report on how prescription drugs are affecting healthcare costs. Number two, the PDAB, as it's um, affectionately called, the Prescription Drug Affordability Board. This was one of my recommendations in my report, and I worked with um, some of you on getting this passed um, this past session. The PDAB has the authority to conduct an annual affordability review on 24 drugs a year and establish upper payment limits on some drugs if they have led to excess patient costs. Um, um, but of course, we know the limitations on this because many of us worked on this bill. Um, it has a long ramp up period and not many drugs can be reviewed and also no penalties can be assessed for excessive price increases. So I'm hoping that we can return to that one over the years and make some improvements to that. Um, before I get into this next one, I wanna just explain a bit um, what a pharmacy benefit manager is um, because it's um, not necessarily intuitive. Um, they are an entity that's hired by insurance carriers to manage a plan's drug benefits. Um, so this in particular, there's a, a real lack of regulation and transparency for PBMs. Um, it's really pressing. They don't really have much accountability um, in their negotiated rates, and they're not legally required to pass along any savings from their manufacturer rebates. Rebates are the discounts that drug companies can give to a PBM to encourage um, the use of a brand name drug, which we know are uh, more expensive than generic drugs. But um, yeah, anyways, we know that they're accruing massive profits and particularly from rebates because they're not sharing those savings with plans or with enrollees. So here in Washington, um, we, uh, have a relatively new bill passed in 2020 that requires PBMs to register with the Office of Insurance Commissioner. Um, the bill also prohibits PBMs from reimbursing a pharmacy less than they give an affiliate for the same service. And it also prevents um, PBMs from retroactively denying. Oops. Lost my AirPod. Um, from ret it, it prohibits PBMs from retroactively denying or reducing claims. So um, while we're on the topic of PBMs, I wanna highlight a bill. A, a lot of bills are, are really trying to, to aim at regulating these pharmacy benefit managers. And one such bill was um, passed in California in 2018. And this added a lot of, I think, exciting regulatory authority. 
One, it requires CBMs to register with the State Department of Managed Healthcare state agency. It requires PBMs to engage in good, safe, and fair dealing. So it requires them to reveal any conflicts of interest, whether direct or indirect. Um, it mandates new transparency standards, including reporting of fees that they impose on pharmacies and any money received from manufacturers. It also requires pharmacies to inform um, patients if, or customers if a retail price of a drug is actually lower than what the patient's cost sharing amount would be, um, or just to automatically charge them a lower amount. It also establishes new regulations such as prohibiting PBMs from preventing providers from informing patients of cheaper drugs. And there's a new task force to look at how PBMs are affecting the pharmaceutical market overall. So that is another example of a great policy, in my opinion. And I just wanna thank you very much. I hope this was helpful and please stay tuned. I'm gonna be updating my report sometime this summer with updated data and legislative updates since some of the recommendations were already considered or passed. Um, so I might include some, some new policy solutions as well, but I look forward to working with all of you on this, especially as we prepare for 2023 session. Um, so with that, I will pass it back to Aaron and hear any questions people have. Great, thanks, Sam. Um, great presentation, really appreciate the thoroughness. Um, so now it's time for questions. And I think what we're doing is, um, if you have questions, put them in the chat. Um, and we will, um, we'll sort of go from there. But before we do that, oh. um, okay, uh, sorry. Ron, I have uh, my, my uh, usual pitch, hope so please bear with me. Um, the speakers tonight, Senator Randall, Sam, and Aaron made a strong case for implementing meaningful health care improvements. And uh, we at Healthcare for All also believe that it is critical to create a universal single-payer health care system in our state, and we are working diligently towards that end. We worked closely with the legislature this past session to pass 22 bills that improved Washington, Washington residents' health care. We were a driving force behind the UHC work group and had seven of our members in that group. Their work led to the creation of the UHC Commission, also with many members we advocated for, that is tasked with creating a system to provide health care to all Washington residents. And this group could craft a single payer system based on our bill, the Washington Health Security Trust. And in order to, to maintain our momentum, it is vitally important that we grow our membership, educate the public, and mobilize our supporters to spread the word to their family, friends, and most importantly, their legislators. We can achieve these goals through social media, monthly webinars, meetings with civic groups, and by hosting other events. Our legislative efforts require dedicated lobbyists whom we pay, and we also have a communications specialist on staff. There are other fixed costs to keep, keep, keep us running as well. Uh, these activities require funds, which is why we are asking you to donate tonight. We were encouraged by the support we received through the recent Give Big campaign, but we can really benefit from additional funds. Our goal tonight is $500. And we're really ask, we're asking all of you to go into the chat and look for the link. Uh, actually, there's several links to uh, the don to don make a donation tonight. Or uh, if, uh, if you can't do that right at this moment, go to our website at some point and click on the donate button. You can make a one-time donation, but we would especially appreciate it if you can make a monthly recurring donation. As I like to say, it's like a Netflix subscription, except you might get universal health care instead of movies. Uh, so please donate so we can spread the word and bring about universal single payer health care in Washington. And now it's time for Q&A. All right. Thanks, Peter, for that, uh, in, that interlude. I have to say I'm very impressed with Healthcare for All's um, uh, fundraising pitching. Well, well done. Organizations like this can't, can't operate without, without, without all of our support. Okay. Thank you. So, um, so we're, we're looking at questions in the chat. Um, um, let's see. 
uh, here's uh, here's one 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 ask, uh, Sam. Is could you say something about provider cost risk sharing and value based payments? And and I think the the, the person who's asking this is you know. So what's it's th those mechanisms? What's their role in con cost control or cost out of control? That's a good question. I I didn't really focus on on VBP value based um, payments as much. Um, and so, yeah, I, I will actually need to get back to you on that. But I think that there are so many awesome um, policy proposals that that other states are doing and that Washington State is doing. Um, so I yes, it's I, I'm not an expert on everything. But I yeah, I'd like to learn more about that. And um, so I don't have an answer for you on that right now. But good question. I have an opinion. Thank you. Please. <laughs> This is a, as, this can be a group discussion as 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 you as you can expect. I mean, we've been experimenting with value based payment and under various names for decades now. The theory being, if you know, we can figure out how to pay providers um, in a way that they improve efficiency and and quality, that the whole system will improve. But um, I think the the evidence is pretty weak about all these experiments. Um, so, uh, anyways, that would be my response. Um, I have a thought about the Massachusetts piece. I noticed somebody asked a question about that. What's that? Um, Paul, Paul asked a question, how is Massachusetts fared making hospitals, um, required to become ACOs on a budget, um, tied to the GDP of the state? So I assume that's, um, referring to their cost growth benchmark. Um, I think that in some ways it's been their, um, their success has been somewhat limited. And I think that that could be because the Massachusetts market um, has kind of already been consolidated pretty significantly. And um, from my reading, I think that that is one thing that Washington state is really trying to get out in front of um, because our system is definitely on its way to being um, consolidated to the, to the level that Massachusetts, um, their market is, but we haven't reached that level yet. Um, but I think one thing that I'm keeping my eye on and actually something that recently happened is the um, Health Policy Commission in Massachusetts um, just last month required the Massachusetts General Hospital um, to submit a cost control plan um, because its prices and spending have um, exceeded the, that of other hospital systems. And so that is something that they um, haven't been doing very much of, is trying to actually you know, take, get some teeth behind it and enforce the cost growth benchmark. So I'm really excited to see what's going to happen from that. Um, and I, in fact, one of the uh, Massachusetts hospital, um, the general hospital's expansion proposals was actually rejected um, because it would it, it was found to it was going to um, result in a 20, 28 million dollar increase in cost for consumers. Um, so that hospital withdrew its request. So I think that um, things like that where we can get more teeth and more enforcement behind um, behind the cost growth benchmark, I will I would love to see Washington cost board um, do things like that down the line is to really add enforcement. So Sam, here's a, here's a question actually, and this, if, if Senator Randall is still on, uh, be interested to hear her thoughts about this, but it's, it's, you know, what would it take to offset the influence you, you mentioned of, of the healthcare industry? And this question is specifically about the hospital's influence on the healthcare cost transparency board and the legislature. Like to rephrase, how do we address hospitals' oversized influence on on the market, but yeah. also in passing? Uh, yeah. I, I think this is this is you know more not so much on the market, but on sort of the state level policy work. Politically, yeah. Maybe I'll let Senator Randall speak to that one. Sure. Um, this is definitely like a, a question that I grapple with constantly you know the our mergers and acquisition bill the keeper care act is 
struggled because of just this. And, um, you know, I, th I think part of it is where are legislators getting the most pressure from? And, you know, com coming from the, the movement world and not the policy making world, people have a lot of power when we work together. So if, if the collective power of people is louder and stronger than um, just the paid lobbyists, you know, who work for the hospitals and the healthcare systems, I think that's a way that we see change. And, you know, we talk as lawmakers about what, you know, what the inside game and the outside game, how do we work inside with our colleagues and how do we work outside to keep the pressure on the issues that we care most about. So it really takes that sort of hand in hand approach. And candidly, sometimes it's also like the different makeup of the legislature that makes different things possible. Um, I'm wearing my official hat. So that's as much as I'll say about that right now. But um it's a challenge. It's a challenge, but it's, I don't think it's one that's insurmountable. You know, we see the a window shift on what's possible, depending on how much, you know, how much it's on the minds and mouths and emails of neighbors. And we've seen some, a lot of progress just in a handful of years. And well, I think we'll continue to see progress. And you're, that's why this work is so important because it's about building that community coalition of neighbors who will who will keep up um, the pressure. Yeah, and if I can add to that, I think that's absolutely right. And, um, you know, I think maybe in, in, our, in our dialogue about, you know, what's wrong with our healthcare system, I think the, the finger of blame often gets placed on insurance companies, um, whereas hospitals are kind of seen as, you know, the good guy, like they're providing care and their employers of so many people in our communities. And um, those are those are true things. Um, but at the same time, I think it's really important to kind of highlight the what, what I shared in my presentation about their outsized profits and how much they're paying their, their CEOs um, at the same time that our healthcare workers are being, um, you know, on the front lines and helping us get through the pandemic are really forced to work overtime and not get breaks and not get um, good pay. So I think that can really kind of help us in the messaging of, you know, talking about um, hospitals and, and how they have kind of an outsized um, influence on the market and also politically. Um, I wanna thank our, our three guests, the Senator, uh, uh, Sam and Aaron for their uh, expert uh, presentations and, and good answers to the questions and, um, and you know we, we support all these all these great reforms and we hope that you will all support us and come back month after month for our webinars and visit our website and if we ever have in-person events again please come to please come to them and just close to uh, alert everyone uh, make sure everyone knows that our second wednesday speaker program on june 8th will be uh on improving insulin access kevin wren from Insulin for All will be leading a discussion in June. So please join us then. Thank you all.